Yes, you want to get started? If you don't mind, just take a seat. So uh, thanks once again for coming tonight. We got a great presentation today. So just a, before we get started, just a few quick announcements. Uh, first of all, thank George and Lee Wan for allowing us to host you. So please give a round of applause to Lee. Uh, secondly, a uh, good thing. Uh, so we have a, another great meetup on Monday. Uh, it's uh, from some folks at Cloudera. I also uh, set up a location, so if you just take a look at the website, you can take a look, find the space where it's going to be hosted at. Uh, lastly, uh, Big Day Ready LA, uh, it's on, it's going to be July 9th, uh, it's going to be at West LA College, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be great, the same as last year, completely free. Uh, we're going to pretty soon get a call out for speakers, so feel free to, you know, uh, pass any abstracts and the presentations for submission. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand over to, to Arun Murthy. So, just quickly, Arun Murthi is a co founder of Hortonworks. He's also uh, one of the main uh, 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 one, of the, one of the main Apache Hadoop EBMC members, and he's a great of Apache uh, yeah. So, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Arun. Uh, please give a round of applause. Thank you. Thanks a lot for organizing. Uh, Deep one for having us. Um, obviously, all you guys are showing up. Uh, I'm sure there's pizza, so. You yeah, uh, just. All this actually, one second. No, sorry. <laughs> uh, the pizza is delayed, so it's probably going to be at the end of the meetup, so uh, please wait and you should get the pizza at the end. Thanks. Yeah, I request the so make sure you get all the All right. Um, hey, so. Like I said, brief introduction. My name is Arun Murthy. I'm one of the co founders of Hardworks. I've been working in uh, the space. Can you hold the mic up? Better? Yeah. Hold it closer. Yeah. Um, working here pretty much since uh, day one, sort of like a lot of the original team of Yahoo. Uh, we were part of Search. Um, and so sort of Search is sort of the For me, it's like the, you know, the quintessential big data app. Uh, to give an example, we, we started working here because we wanted a system back in Yahoo to store about 10 to 12 copies of the web, right? And it's literally we want to build, you know, the equivalent of a time machine for the web because as you can talk about and so on, relevance and search algorithms, we want to go back in time and see how the tools can work against uh, different, uh, or, no, different versions of the web, if you will. It's so true. We, we sort of got, got Um, we start, we all uh, you know, sort of spun off the album 2011. Um, we start off, uh, you know, hard notes back then. Uh, it's been an amazing journey uh, to see the dude from, you know, sort of this little diet project we took on in 20, 2006. Uh, it's funny, one of my uh, co founders just put out a blog post on our, our blog where he took the first, really the first release of the dude we made, I think it was in like April. 2006, and he made that doc of image of it, so you guys can download the very, very first version of it and play on your laptop. Uh, it's pretty instructive to see how far we've come as a, as a team, as a community, it's been a problem, right? So now, a little bit about our works, um, like I said, started in 2011, we went public in uh, 2014, end of 2014, uh, three and a half years in, it's been pretty amazing. We're the first sort of big data company to go as a public company. And obviously, we started off, start off on Hadoop, right, um, as a Hadoop uh, vendor and a distributor. But clearly, as we've seen, 
the enterprise and folks like yourself um, take up to do. It's clear that we had to go beyond this to do, right? In the sense that we had to figure out how to get data from all places it's getting generated, whether it's cell phones, whether it's um, you know sensors, Fitbit, what have you. So last year uh, at Hardworks, we made an acquisition of a company called Omniara. Uh, these guys are the guys behind NiFi. Their story is similar to ours at Yahoo. They built all the NSA building out NiFi. NiFi is this really cool piece of technology which allows you to get data in, ingest it, not just to ingest, but also process it on the edge. Um, and also change the flow at runtime. So you can actually go in, change your code on the device, on the edge device. So you can actually do not just the analytics, but you can also reconfigure the full flow at runtime. So what you see here is this all at hard modes, we now feel like we have two very, two very, very distinct but very, very related products. Obviously we have HTTP, which is what we call the data at rest. That's the classic Hadoop ecosystem. And we have HDF or hard modes data flow, which allows you to ingest data, uh, process it in real time at the edge, and also control the flow at runtime in a bypass. That's the that's the power we see. Uh, that's the sort of cable you want to bring to the market um, right now. All right, so that's about that's not about modern words. Let's talk a little bit about you know Hadoop. Um, and to really understand Hadoop um, and look ahead, it's, all, it's always useful to have a little bit of context about where Hadoop came from, why we made certain decisions at the time we made them. Um, whether it was 2006 or 2008 or 2009. It's been fun to go through the journey. Um, hopefully you guys have a flavor of you know, why we made certain decisions. You know, some worked out, some didn't. You know, hopefully many did. Um, and also, you know, part of some of the mistakes we did back then. So before we sort of think about this, now it's, it's always important to remember that we do uh, start off as just two things, right? It started off as HDFS and MapReduce. Um, one one project, one sub project allowed you to store data. The other projects allowed you to cross data. But I always go back to like do now has become a brand, uh, less than a project. So I always I always keep this in mind, which is this notion of a ship of you know. I don't know how many of you have heard of the CS paradox. It says you take a ship, replace every bit of wood on that ship with a new piece of wood. The question is, does the wood remain the same? Or does the ship remain the same? Right? So keep that in mind as we talk about the review. So in the beginning, like I said, we just said SJFS and Avenues, right? And we were we were focused on having, you know, we were focused on, on doing just batch analytics at massive scale, right? Uh, with bad reviews. And store, store, you know, literally petabytes of data. The very, very first design spec we came up for Hadoop. At that point, we needed to store about we needed about ten thousand machines. This is back in two thousand and five, before we started on the project. We needed ten thousand machines to store the amount of data we had to store. So remember, back then, um, commodity hardware was about you could get about four, four terabytes on a single box. So to store the amount of data we needed, we got to put together a thousand of these machines, you know, taking account into the three bed application, all of that stuff, right? That was where we started. Um, pretty quickly, it was evident that we had to allow people, clearly, um, people started pulling a lot of data into Hadoop. This is back, way back at the Yahoo and Facebook and you know, those days. Uh, people started pulling a lot of data, and it was pretty obvious that you had to allow people to interact with the data in more than one shape, right? At that point, you can only do batch analytics. It was pretty clear you had to allow people to interact with the data with batch and real time and streaming and so on. So that was really why we started to work on this project called Yarn, right? The idea was that we wanted to allow people to plug in different engines so that you can actually interact with data in different shapes and forms, right? And obviously, it's kind of hard to predict um, 
what technologies come along at what points in life cycle, but we just want to make sure that you can actually get, we can allow different engines to plug in and access data in a, in a seamless fashion, right? Now, obviously, if you look back now, uh, that certainly worked out well with technologies like you know Spark and Hive and all those things, which have come in to allow people to do different sorts of things with data. Right. right. So the analogy I sort of used in the past is that um, back way back with Hadoop, you know, one dot X, um, starting up in two thousand six and eight, it was like having Windows with only Notepad. Right. So you can do whatever you want in Notepad. You can write, draw a doodle there. Right, but you really can't do anything very, very specific. So you can't. What you'd like to do is actually, you know, plug in an Excel and a and a VI and a and a pop and a PowerPoint. Right? So that was the analogy we had in mind. It allows us to plug in different engines, um, and you know, it's it's been pretty successful from a number of dimensions because not only has the open source communities like Storm and Spark and Solar and Edgebase uh, picked it up to run on Yarn, but we now have you know. Um, even proprietary systems like SaaS and IBM and you know HP and those products actually run on your access data and database, right? So that's what we're focusing. Um, obviously, Spark come along in the last couple of years, and that's great, right? Because the idea always had been to let a thousand flowers bloom and let everybody pick up different ways of accessing and interacting that data, right? And Spark is clear, pretty clearly one of the most exciting things to happen in this space, and we want to see more of this. Um, how many of you have heard of Clink? Right, so, so there's clearly, there's always going to be innovation in this space, and that's great. We want to make sure all that innovation can happen in a consistent manner. So what have we been doing uh, to make sure that Spark and Group work well together? Bunch, bunch of work, right? You got to make sure that, you know, for example, you can share RDDs. Um, so what we did was we've been working on an HDFS, what it calls an in-memory tier. How many for uh, the tier stored in HDFS? A lot. So what HDFS in the past did was it only understood one storage class. So you can only do basic hard disks, right, or JVOD. So what we've done in the last couple of years in HDFS is add the capability for HDFS to understand different tiers of storage. So you have memory as a tier. SSD is a pure hard disk and slow disk, right? Or even very, very cold storage, right? So with the in-memory tier, we can we've been working to make sure the Spark RDDs can, can actually be written to HDFS and shared between different users. Right? And that's pretty cool because now you can actually instead of having every user cache the data for himself, you can keep those RDDs and share it with a bunch of users, right? So that's great. We've been also working on things like making sure that with yarn. You actually get the best resource management possible for Spark. So, for example, we recently added dynamic dynamic executors uh, with node locality in mind, right? So that's 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 been a big ask in the community for a long time, right? Similarly, we've worked on things like security and governance. I'll talk a little bit more um, and integration with a bunch of other technologies like make sure Spark really works well with ORC, make sure it works well with Edge Space. So, for example, we can. Going forward, you'll be able to put data in HBase and define co-processors inside HBase so that when you access that data, when you try to access data in HBase to a co-processor, most of the processing is happening in HBase rather than pulling that data off the wire into a Spark memory space. Right? So you can actually now distribute it out significantly better rather than having to pull all the data in. Right? So lots and lots of work happening to make sure that not only, that, not only do we improve Spark, with things like dynamic executors, but also make sure you can actually push as much of the integration across the entire ecosystem, whether it's Ambari, whether it's you know Atlas for metadata, and so on and so on. Right. Um, last but not least, uh, user interfaces uh, is really important. Um, how many of you here have heard of uh, Zeppelin before? Some hands go up. So Zeppelin is really cool because uh, it again shows the power of sort of open innovation. Uh, there's a small company out of Korea called NF Labs. They built this really cool sort of notebook metaphor for Spark called Zeppelin, it's, and, and they open sourced it. So we've been working with them, uh, both with friends at Microsoft, and, and I'm sure like we've seen like folks like Amazon show up on, this, on the mailing list at Zeppelin. So what Zeppelin is, uh, it's actually a notebook 
so that you can actually do all of the Spark analytics in a web, in a web friendly manner using an output. So you can actually write a Spark query right there in the, in the uh, screen you see there, and you get output and you can actually visualize it right there. And once you visualize it, you can actually share it with the coworker to, to do things like collaboration and so on. You get versioning and get get like It's really, really cool. Um, so we take as part of HTTP, you, you know, we've done many, many beta releases, so we should have a final beta soon and go to GA the first half of the year. Uh, I'm really excited about this stuff. Um, now, if you go sort of the wider enterprise, um, people love Spark, but there's also SQL, which is super important, right? And as a result, we've been doing a lot of work in the Apache Hive community uh, for, a, for a number of years. We start off with what we call it the Sting Initiative. Uh, the reason we got the Sting Initiative was just that we had to do a work all across the stack, whether it was an HTFS, whether it was Yarn, whether it was Mac, you know, MapReduce, and then we, we, we built a new engine called this and finally in, in height. So we had to work all across the stack, and it took you know, like 30 months across 15 companies. You know, uh, great props to folks like Microsoft. They did a lot of work. They contributed to the ORC platform. Um, you know, nearly half a million lines of code went between went into went into Hive. So just code Hive, right? Between uh, 2000, you know, 13 and 2004. So what we were able to do was take quick, take literally tens of minutes down to single single digits, um, single digit seconds. And what it allowed us to do was get get a lot of people to do mass amounts of processing in a in a relatively, relatively human time frame, right? So that's where we start off with Hive. Um, some of the work we did back then was things like, I talked about the ORC file format. We built a new engine at that point called DES. Um, DES allowed us to move away from MapReduce, the only underlying engine of the primitive. And finally, we had to do what is called as uh, vectorized query processing. Um, that's pretty interesting because if you look at a modern CPU, the way you process data on it, or the way you can efficiently process data on it, is significantly different than it was even you know five or ten years ago, right? So modern CPU has many many execution units. So on a single clock cycle, you can actually execute multiple instructions, right? So take take a simple example where you have a SQL query which says select x from y where you know age greater than five. The primitive or the predicate a is greater than five, you can actually do multiple of those on the same clock cycle every now and then. Right? However, to do that, you got to organize your entire processing pipeline to be very, very specific. So, for example, you cannot have a CPU stall, or you know, for example, if you have a let's say a, a virtual function call, your compiler cannot generate instructions because it can't see through the virtual function, right? So your CPU stalls. Or if you have Let's say an L1 and L2 cache miss, you stall again. So why would you get an L1 cache miss? If you use Java objects, for example, and you have pointers all over the place, your CPU stalls because it hasn't the data, the pointer it points to isn't in your L1 cache. Right? So we do all of this work. Um, so for example, in Hive, we rewrote the entire pipeline, the, the processing pipelines, the filters, and the joins, and so on. So they all use native types. Small int instead of capital integer, right? And then we also removed all the virtual function calls we had uh, because Hive had this object inspector model that we had to go away from, right? So a bunch of work, as you imagine, it was rewriting significantly large parts of Hive to get to get that here, right? Um, so this was, like I said, done a year and a half, two years ago. We sort of completed the phase one of it, and now what we want to get get further ahead is sort of what we call a sub-second SQL. So you can actually put hype behind MicroStrategy or Tableau or Excel. So you can get you can get queries back in you know 200 milliseconds or 600 milliseconds. Right? That's where we call the stigma dot next issue. Some of the work we've already delivered is things like having a cost-based optimizer. Hype SQL hype never had a cost-based optimizer. So we what we did was we went and convinced uh, this individual called Julian, Julian Hyde. Julian was one of the key folks on the Oracle um, um, SQL engine. He then went out and did an open source project called Optic, 
right, which is a cost-based optimizing vendor. So we took Optic and, and made it part of Hive, so we can actually have a full CBR, right? Which means we can actually look at the query, look at the stats, and decide what sorts of joins to do. Um, that's your logical processing. It also does physical optimization to say, do I need to run you know, the equivalent of 10 maps or five maps? Do I need to do a, a, a map join or a hash join or a, or a distributed join, right? So all of these things are what Opti gave us. Um, the next thing which sort of the biggest leap that we're doing is literally removing the last bits of latency we have in terms of startup cost. So today, as you can imagine, right, whether it's Spark or, or Tez or, or Map News, you have this fixed cost of launching a JVM. That's pretty expensive. Launching a JVM on my Mac takes a minimum of on about 150 milliseconds, right? That is with a that was a, that is with an absolutely minimal class path. If you have if you have class path which is significantly larger, um, one of my pet peeves with Java is that the class loading is enormously slow because there's no equivalent of a shared object in Java, right? So what Java will do is when you have a class in a a big class path, it literally goes stack or look for the jar on every single class path. Or look for that class, the jar containing the class and every single class path. It doesn't even cache it. So I literally go to, if you have a significantly large class path, you literally do 1500 stacks looking for every jar. Right? And that's really slow. So what we do is, so that's one piece. The second piece is, um, what what Sun Sun and now Oracle have done a great job with the JIT. How many of you are familiar with the JIT here? Right? It's a just it's a just in time compiler. What JIT is really good at is it's literally a monitor on your JVM. It watches the instructions being run by your JVM, and if it notices that a specific code path or a specific function is getting called multiple times and there are thresholds being set, it'll actually rewrite at runtime the bytecode in native in native assembly. Right? The reason that's important is because if you do that, you get a, a 10x speed up in your CPU efficiency. Right? Now, one way to do this would have been to rewrite all of this code in native C or C++ or, or something like LVM. We just didn't want to do this because if you go down that path, it's sort of a, it's like a rabbit hole. You can keep writing this forever and ever. And the worst part is you have to actually worry about every CPU architecture. Right? Um, we just didn't want to go down that path. Playing with the chip and basically the investments done by you know Sun and Oracle is what we want to do. However, the problem with the chip is that it needs enough uh, enough number of function calls to get accurate, and you can't really tune the chip. So the problem is if you have a small query, it's actually not crossing a large amount of data. If you want a query which is coming back in, let's say, if you need to come back in, let's say, a couple hundred milliseconds, it's probably crossing less than a billion rows. Now, a billion rows across 100 machines is not a lot of power, which means at that point, your JIT doesn't fire up. So what we had to do was to solve both the startup and the JIT issue, we've now built a daemon called LLAB. LLAB stands for Live Long and Prosper. Um, <laughs> the idea is that we, we have a daemon. In the past, we've done I.O. in the Hadoop ecosystem through HDFS, right? So we've now replaced HDF, we've now augmented the data node with another daemon called LAP, which doesn't do which doesn't do raw I/O, but it does I/O with schema in mind. So it knows your table layouts and the schema and so on, which means it can also cache that data in RAM in the most efficient format possible for that data type. So remember all the vector query crossing we did. LAP now caches vectors of those primitive types in RAM, right? So it's also not only saving you the startup cost, it's also saving you the, de the deserialization cost from this. So that's really huge, right? So what happens now is we have some of this hybrid architecture. We don't have like a pure MPP system like you know, Pivotal Hawk or, or Teradata or whatever. We have a system where half the IO path or the lower half of the database is done in LDAB. All of the joins and so on are done in the classic sort of map and So it's sort of half and half. So you, your IO paths are being done in LAP, your joins are being done outside. 
At Lip, you can still do things like hash joints because you can actually distribute the hat, you know, the dimension tables and so on. But most of the large joints, the, the shuffle joints, are getting done in in, in Spark or Tez or any of these systems. Right? So overall, it gives us significantly larger, uh, significantly huge speed up. It allows us to go from yeah, a query from four seconds to six hundred seconds, which is really big if you're sitting behind Excel or Tableau or Microsoft. Um, the last piece that's also important is that LAP also gives us finally an opportunity to do very, very fine grained <coughs> column level and role level security. Right? So you can now set a policy that says column age can only be seen by users A, B, and C. In the past, we couldn't do this because all of this, all of this data was on HDFS. So anybody who had access to that file had all of that data. Right? So now, because of, since all of that files are being owned by LAP and being and they're being read by LAP, you can set that column level policy. Right? Similarly, you can also set row level policies. You can say Narly can column, Narly can only own access column age. He can only access the column age in rows where the age is greater than 70 or 80. So you can set both row and column level policies at a common point. And by the way, LAP is not height specific. Uh, we've done the work so that you can actually use LAP through SPAR. Map, news, pick, anytime, any, any tool you want. So it's sort of a common way to do I.O. in the Hadoop ecosystem going forward for tablet. Right? Uh, last but not least, uh, we've also had lots of issues in the past with the metastore. As you can imagine, with things like the cost-based optimizer, we've had to have lots and lots of stats, not just you know basic stats like number of rows and number of and number of bytes and so on. We want very extensive stats in terms of Ability to skip portions of a file and store things like bitmap and this is and so on. So the first versions of Hive had used a, 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 a relational database behind it, like you know Postgres or MySQL or Oracle. But we really couldn't scale that system without getting into issues for both access, you know, scalability issues for both access and data. As you can imagine, you sort of the very far, if you keep going down this path, you could literally have more metadata than data. Right? Nice and so on. So what we've now done is we've actually um, got, we've actually, we've been in the process of finishing this up, but we, the idea is to replace the relational database behind Hives and Elstro with HBIS. Right? Because now you have a, a, I mean, sort of an extremely scalable database behind Hive itself for the metadata. Right? The other, the other advantage we get with this is that we can now have, at runtime, we can have every single query fragment, which is when, it, when it's getting processed, get metadata out of edge base. By that, what I mean is that we, if you have, you know, let's say a portion of the query running in the cluster in different parts of the query, in different parts of the cluster, we, 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 we are very careful not to have runtime query fragments query, query the database, because we could literally, if you have a thousand node cluster and you have an Oracle database or a MySQL database sitting there, we could we could overrun the database by having all these twenty thousand map tasks in the database. So it wouldn't scale there. So because we have edge base now, we can actually do that at one day. So you get extremely fast query processing because you have a lot of metadata, and you can actually get that metadata at one time. Um, so what we did right now in Hive without this metastore is that. Since only the query planner at compile time can access the metadata, it, ha it had to get metadata for every single query, for, uh, for the query for all its partition and so on, shove it in the query and, and pass it around the cluster. That's really slow. Right? Because we have we have customers running uh, databases with you know 11, you know, 2 million partitions. Right? And if you want to do the query planning upfront and get 2 million partitions worth of data at a compiler or during the planning phase, it's really slow. So it allows us to push this in, into the cluster in a really scalable manner. I'm actually really excited about this work because it really allows us to scale the metastore and, and get past the issues we had in terms of having a, an even more stronger cost-based optimizer at runtime. Or you can put lots and lots of metadata in terms of you know, bitmaps and indices and group filters and so on into the database and fashion. Um, last but not least, one of the pieces that uh, we've been working on is as you extend this 
notion of metadata, it's not enough to have just you know table metadata and file metadata. What enterprise customers are really asking for is sort of business taxonomies and ontologies on top of the data, right? So you want to be able to tag that data, carry that metadata forward, and so on. So what we've done with a bunch of customers like Aetna and Dog and Warren was we built out a new project we called Apache Atlas. Atlas is sort of the common metadata store for all business metadata store for everything in the resources. Right? So you can now start to tag data as let's say personal PII data in, in, in finance or PHI in healthcare and so on. And you can you tag this data once during ingest. And any tool which is accessing or processing that data, let's say you use Spark or Hive or whatever, and you let's say make a copy of that data, that those tags are automatically inherited. So you don't have to go manually tag every single table out there, right? And this is really nice because once you have an enterprise warehouse, a lot of people accessing the data, you can't go manually tag every single derivation of that data, right? Because people will come in and do a create table or select, and you have maybe a PI data being copied into a new table, right? And if you don't know what's happening there, that's a that's a liability because you could be exposing personal information or PI information without your knowledge. So Atlas automates the whole thing. What's even better with this is that we tied this with Ranger, so you can actually set security policies on the tag. So you can add, so you can have a PI tag which automatically gets inherited, and you can set a security policy with Ranger that says. Only certain sets of users can access any column which is PI again. Right? So that's super important as you scale sort of the you know, warehouse, warehouse and the right? um, Okay, so we have covered sort of the peer storage a little bit, so I'm going to go here. So, in sort of next steps, so this is all sort of what we've done in the past, where we've come to. As you start to look ahead, there's a, there's a little bit of this, some interesting stuff on the horizon, right? So obviously, IoT is big. Uh, we call it the we are all in the internet engine because it's not just about your toasters and drivers, right? It's about your cell phones, your all the data that's getting generated with sensors. Now you can now I got a, a twenty dollar Raspberry Pi on my doorbell, which takes photographs every time you click my bell, my door, right? So this sort of stuff is getting really, really big. Um, in terms of trends, obviously with things like Hadoop, it's really cheap to collect, store, and analyze this data, right? And that's sort of been the, one of the biggest, biggest um, outcomes of the Hadoop ecosystem. But it's also, remember, it's also really, really cheap now to move data now, right? So for example, in the past, if you had an oil well somewhere in the Middle East, you had to, you had to collect data through a satcom, like you need a satellite connection to to move data around. Now you can actually use 3G networks to do it. And it's like several orders of magnitude cheaper to do that, to move bytes around. Right? So the combination of the fact that you can actually move bytes around and store it is really changing how people look at data. Um, the next step we see is there's a real trend around uh, containerization. Obviously, you know, you go back to the 80s and 90s, there was one processor, one process. With virtualization, you could you could actually virtualize the processor to get many, many apps there. With containerization, it's taking to the next level. Because you can do it without the sort of the overheads of virtualization, right? Obviously, Docker is sort of the poster child there. Yeah. The other thing to remember is that containerization gives you not only just sort of the isolation of virtualization of the process, it also gives you isolation of the software environment, right? Which means you can now rely on having the right version of Perl or Python or, or Libc or whatever, whatever you want. So on the same machine without having to, you know, install a bunch of RPMs and cut up, you know, cut up every other app running on that on that on that machine, right? Having done in a cheap manner with Docker is really useful. So as we see these trends with you know virtualization, with containerization, and sort of the ability to collect data, what we see out there um, at our customers um, is. People are starting to build these what I call these modern apps, and these modern apps are all data are backed by data, right? In the sense that it's no longer about having every app own its data. You can have a common store for data with things like HDFS and soon now LAV. You can start to build all these intelligent apps which are highly data, right? 
But to build these apps, they've got to be easy to consume and operate. They've got to be sort of secure from the ground up, and equally important that they're repeatable. Which means you want to be able to take the same app, run it on your test, dev, test, and production environments, and not have to go fiddle with versions of Perl or Python and Libc and Java and so on. Right? That repeatability is super important for your for the ability to take new apps to market fast. Right? So. What, what we're seeing also is that as people build out apps, these apps are getting more and more complex, right? And these apps are not just a Spark app or an HPS app or a Storm app. In our world, we have to put all these technologies together to solve a use case, whether it's customer churn, whether it's customer 360, whether it's, you know, <clears throat> um, sort of trying to figure out who's the bad guy attacking the system. You got to do all this work in conjunction with a bunch of technologies we have, right, in, in the group stack. So what we see as sort of the next step in making this really useful in the group ecosystem and easy to use and repeatable is we, we need to be able to assemble these engines and services uh, as a whole, right? So it's not now no longer about just Spark and HPS and Hive. It's about can you assemble this into a, into a package or an assembly that you can actually secure and operate as a whole, not as just a bunch of technologies. So you go to your Hadoop cluster, you should not be thinking in terms of just, you know, a Storm app and a Spark app. You should be thinking in terms of a customer churn app or a customer optimization app or a, or a market optimization app, right? And equally importantly, with technologies like um, Apache and Wari, which has got ability to write your own UI and plug it in, you can now put these technologies together and also write a UI on top. So you can actually see it, see it as a customer churn app. Right? So what we want to do is take the next step um, and leverage technologies like Yarn and Docker so you can actually get this assembly to work for you. Like you can go or have a menu where you pick a service and engine, wire them together, and also secure and operate them as a whole. Right? So that's sort of the assembly engine for your apps on the new product. Right? And there are several examples. Um, you know, cybersecurity is a great one, right? So at Hortonworks, we went and uh, we announced this. Uh, we announced the work. We announced uh, support for an engine, for an app we call Metron. Apache Metron is a new pro new project to start. Metron is a cybersecurity app. It's, it previously was called OpenSoc. It was it was a but it was started by a bunch of guys in Cisco. What OpenSoc does is pretty complex. It allows you to get all your data from your network, right? Whether it's network stream or data store or six log or app logs, when right? it uses technologies to, you know, like NiFi, Cache and Swamp to parse and rich and persist that data. And finally, we run all these analytics on top, whether it's speak app for packet analytics, whether it's sort of predictive modeling to do threat detection. The open sock is that sort of framework to build these security apps, right? Now, if you think about this, that's what we talk about as an assembly, right? So OpenSock or Metron now is sort of the first app, first assembly we at Hardware to bring to market. We obviously want everybody else in the market to, um, you know, build these apps. So you can share it out. You, you should have. It's really simple. The way we look at this is that your your app is two components. There's a blueprint for your app. The blueprint says I want five containers of Kafka, two containers of Storm, three containers of Spark, right? Now, the business logic obviously lies in Docker containers for each of these, and you wire them together as a whole, so that you can, so that Kafka can discover Storm, which can discover, you know, Zookeeper, which can discover, you know, Spark, and vice versa. So once you have this assembly, you check this in a GitHub. I could go in, pick up the assembly you built, right? I can replace. Storm and Spark streaming, if you will, and I can replace your business logic with my own in my own Docker container, and I can go to an existing Hadoop cluster and go run that whole thing as a whole, the whole assembly as well. And I also have a UI for it, so you can look at this as the customer churn app, or the customer 360 app, right? Or open source, which is a cybersecurity app, right? That's what we we really think is the next step in the Hadoop ecosystem. The first now we're sort of at the cusp of the end of the first decade of Hadoop. We really feel like the second decade of Hadoop is how we make these apps so that enterprises like you know, a Toyota or a Home Depot can actually get 
business value out of the loop, not just worry about the different pieces of technology in this side. Right? With that, thanks so much for coming and happy to take some questions here. Yeah, we don't. So the question is about compaction and metadata. We don't really see that as an issue because um, HBase can literally deal with hundreds of billions of objects. Right? In this case, we're talking an hour of magnitude less than that. So if we did the sizing, you could put a lot of metadata and we could get away with a two or three node edge space, possibly. So it's not a lot of data at all from that perspective. In terms of the scale that edge space is used to or to dealing with, this is much, much lesser. Right? But it's still significantly larger than what a, like a MySQL would deal with. But the nice part is we can scale this. Um, pretty much infinitely from that standpoint, right? The other advantage that space gives us is that we also we've known for a long way how to solve multi DC with edge space, so you can now actually have multi DC metadata, right? So that's really cool. So a question about high validity. So high validity right now um, is in Hive 2 branch. Um, so if you want to pick it up, you can play with it right now. But I expect the Hive community to have Hive 2 out in the next, literally in the weeks right now, in the next few weeks. So you can play with that. Like I said, we've, we've actually had a number of, uh, we've been working with a number of partners and customers. So we had a, lot, a really large customer in, uh, I think it's in Japan. They've been using LAP for a while. Their literally their use case was they want to do uh, their, uh, their strict requirement was to be able to do hundred thousand queries per second per hour. So they're literally doing hundred thousand queries per hour using on Hive um, using a like there. Other questions? All right, cool. Thanks. I'll hang around if you guys have any more questions. Thanks, man. <laughs> David, you want to say something? David, David and I work at Hardworks. He's here in LA. Uh, hi, my name is David Kaiser. I'm in the field engineering team at Hardworks. One of the cool things I can do is work with Arun and many of our innovative engineers that build a lot of this technology, and then work with the customers and the rest of the community. Uh, specifically, I work in the Southwest region here, so between Santa Barbara and San Diego. If there's work going on in the landscape of Hadoop, and specifically building solutions around HTTP, that's what I and my team do. The reason I'm mentioning this is I'm actually looking for people that love to do that kind of work. So we're hiring here in Southern California. Um, you can go check out hardworks.com slash careers. There's some listings for solution engineering, um, or the shortcut way to do that is just come up and talk to me. Come ask me what I do, and uh, we'll have a great conversation tonight. Thanks. Uh, thanks everyone once again for coming. Uh, pizza is on its way, give it about five or ten minutes. To be, uh, sorry for the delay. Uh, please come to the seat a little bit. So, if you we'll wait for a few more minutes, just meet you there. Thank you. Oh,